It's a pleasure to be here and speak with you today. Thank you, Professor Lowell, for the invitation. So I'll, I'll quickly begin with a, a bit of my background because I think it provides some uh, insight into the journey of how I got here because this is quite a, a unique idea and, and a novel uh, way to look at things. Uh, and we'll be kind of questioning some, some work taboos uh, that have been, in, in, uh, been around for quite a while. So in 2010, I started a computer vision company focusing on facial expression recognition. And we were basically using web cameras to detect uh, faces, age, emotion, uh, and using that information for advertising and for um, audience measurement purposes. And I ended up getting that company acquired in 2015, sold it through an investment bank, worked at a venture fund in San Francisco, uh, mentoring companies, helping them with their go-to-market, their fundraising, and then also was able to uh, be part of a management consulting firm. So I've worked in emerging tech for the last 15 years, uh, from companies that are Series A to Series B, all the way up through large multinationals that were spinning off various projects. And so that really made me question um, some of the practices that are in place today. And if you look at the current structures that are there today, they are basically made in, in uh, these mental models are adopted from um, an older way of thinking, an industrial age way of thinking, the way business should be done, the way a company should be structured. And the challenge in that is you have all these new capabilities. You have artificial intelligence, you have blockchain, you have some of these new capabilities and tools. And the tendency is to say, how can I take these new tools and put them on top of an existing governance structure? It's hard to absorb the benefits of those new tools to its fullest extent. So the question was, how can we build a new type of governance structure with the understanding of these tools, with the understanding of economics, but more importantly, with the understanding of the human factors and uh, constructing a model that is more beneficial for society as a whole, because we can all read the papers today and see that we're all in a, uh, there's a there's mess all over the place for a variety of different factors. Um, so I'm going to go into that a bit today, but there is a bit of uh, unlearning that will be necessary. In fact, uh, Alan Toffler uh, wrote a really great book in 1970 called Future Shock, um, where people are having a hard time absorbing the influx of information as it's coming. We're disconnected from local communities. Uh, there's the Dunbar number where we have 150 relationships, and that has been pushed to its limits. The issue that we're running into today is that we're trying to adopt and absorb new types of technologies with the constraints of an older Industry 3.0 uh, frame, frame of mind. So we are at this transition point between a governance that was made during a time when everybody was centralized in a facility, you had people going into a factory, uh, people would work uh, on the assembly line, and a lot of the workplace processes and even a lot of the educational way of teaching of creating new kinds of workers uh, is derived from that kind of model. And in the new model, we find that if you look go to Silicon Valley, you talk to different tech startups, they structure themselves in very different ways. And it's, it's interesting to explore the two different areas. So the future of work faces many challenges. Um, I don't think you can attend a lecture, go to a conference, uh, read a newspaper article, or hear a business luminary uh, talk about, not hear the words, the future of work. Um, so it is a, a constant thing, and the themes are basically the same. You have a collaborative mindset, the need to have lifelong learning, the need to uh, push the boundaries of where we're going to as a species and as a society, uh, but there really isn't a lot of meat on the bones. There, there are these kind of vague, nuanced ideas, and the purpose of what we wanted to do together as a consortium, which is really what Black Box AI is, is pull together various stakeholders and researchers and say, how can we look at this a little bit differently? And how can we put together an actionable plan uh, that would actually look at how can we solve some of the problems that are inherent in the current governance structure, understanding the capabilities that exist and what we can do differently. So one of those things is AI automation. Uh, that's talked about quite frequently and there's a lot of uh, hype around AI for specialized talent. <coughs> And in order to get that talent, we have to be more adaptable and flexible to looking at the whole planet as a uh, global source of, of, uh, of resource. Lastly, there's changing demographics. So um, there are 10,000 baby boomers retiring every single day. And uh, more and more, there is gonna be an increase of, of millennials and Gen Zs and the, the expectations that they have for work are very different from generations of the past. In generations of the past, they were mostly concerned with feeding their belly and the lower needs of Maslow's hierarchy, and now they're looking for self-actualization. And where do you go for that? If you want to have social impact as a millennial or as a Gen Z, um, you know, do you go to school for that? Do you go to an employer? Do you have a desk job? And they're, they're a bit uh, disillusioned with the way work is today. In fact, uh, 
Professor uh, David Graeber from the London School of Economics wrote a book recently called um, Bullshit Jobs, A Theory. And I think it's really telling on the state of affairs today is that we have organizations that are created where in some cases 80% of those jobs are unnecessary, but they exist simply to fill a power vacuum. And uh, it's one of those things I think we need to really consider as we look at the next generation of work. Perhaps automation has already eaten up a lot of the jobs, but due to politics and a mandate for a 3 to 5% unemployment rate, we've filled those in with meaningless jobs that don't actually equal value, and the people that work at them know that, but 80% of those people won't actually say that to their superiors. So AI does bring benefits uh, to society um, but and, and the enterprise, but we do need to prepare, and it is a very different mindset. So there's a shifting relationship between the employer and the employee in days past. You would have lifelong employment, you would have pensions. Uh, there was an expectation that there was a, um, a, a greater relationship between the employer and the employee, and that has uh, all but gone away. Uh, now workers today have five, six different jobs. They have... Uh, a uh, much shorter time period. I think IBM, 60% uh, of their employees have been there for less than four years. Many people work five to six jobs at once, different projects that they do, they're a gig worker. So there is a shifting relationship between these two types of, uh, really, of employers and employees. <coughs> Augmented work and AI coming in to solve the repetitive drudgery, but that does mean we're gonna have an increased sophistication. So as the Walmart barcode scanners get replaced and Amazon Go technology starts creeping into retail, and other these, these other tools start to, to permeate into the world, uh, we're gonna have more and more people that are needed. You're gonna need the, the guy to fix the robot. Also, virtual enterprises, which are created for shared common goals, and we're seeing this more where companies are coming together as a consortium to solve problems that may be more challenging with, than any one particular company can have, and the ability for small teams to join forces in that type of way. William Gibson has a great quote, which is, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. So it's really easy to uh, either look, be in a bubble if you come from Silicon Valley and think everywhere is just like this. Um, I come from Michigan, so it's a very different manufacturing kind of mindset. So their expectation of technology is still very linear. They look at technology from the perspective of going from 1980 to 1990 and not necessarily looking at it from the exponential perspective considering Moore's law. So there is a accelerating rate of technology, uh, but it is not evenly distributed. There are some readiness challenges for big companies. So I think some of the other research previously was talking about that. There is a readiness challenge in that there is huge investments outside of your core competency. Many companies are now transitioning to a data-centered model. Uh, if you're in insurance, you're in data. If you're in banking, you're in data. If you're in pretty much any industry now, you're in data. Uh, so there's some challenges to filling that skill gap because many of those uh, people want to work at a uh, a company like Google or, or, or some other company, and, and attracting talent may be more, com more competitive for some than for others. Uh, there's a lack of talent being able to analyze all the data. We have data that's coming from other humans, we have data coming from other machines, and increasingly so sensors. A uh, lack of understanding around AI's ROI impact. Um, there are a lot of companies that really fail to understand the uh, technical capabilities and the business case. They either understand one or the other, and being able to match those two things together has been a problem. It's the translation between the business case and the finance uh, over into what technical capabilities exist and how to translate that over into ROI impact. Technology looking for a problem. So a lot of companies, if they do have an R&D-centered focused culture, uh, you often build a technology and it's like, how can this solve, this is kind of from the other perspective, how do I take these capabilities and shoehorn them into a business problem and uh, find some sort of way to commercialize it. Uh, and then there's also legacy issues in that as well, that you have existing standard operating procedures, and how do you take those existing tools, or those new tools, and apply it to those existing procedures when it comes to human beings. A lot of companies just don't know where to start. So there's funding issues, there are, there's budget constraints, and the prospect of digital transformation is quite daunting. If you're a company and you're thinking, we have to do digital transformation, um, I've talked to some manufacturers, and they think of it as a box they put on an assembly line. They watch too many science fiction movies, and so they anthropomorphize this general intelligence that's super smart. You know, Dave opened the pod bay doors. So it's, it's one of those things that I find that we have to really kind of reset their expectation of what AI is, and that it is a narrow, specific uh, algorithm that can do a very narrow, specific thing. It's not going to be generally applicable to everything. 
Uh, Clayton Christensen says another great quote, which says that the worst place to develop a new business model is from within your existing business model. I think the one exception to that is probably Amazon, and they've done a fantastic job when you look at uh, the Amazon Kindle and their bookstore and you know, cannibalizing their existing business and then expanding out from there. But very few other companies have a real challenge with that. So the problem is fragmented data and services are cross silos. So there are <coughs> silos that exist within customer service, and uh, you have marketing journeys that don't connect to sales journeys, that don't connect to customer support journeys, even within the same organization. So with a company of 50,000 employees, being able to gather all those companies up into small groups has become more of a trend, uh, seeing the, the rise of tribes within large enterprise organizations. So an AI governance framework is really needed to solve some of these complex governance issues. <laughs> Thinking about the societal uh, concentration of capital and its impact on politics, its impact on the world, its impact on society, and looking at it from, uh, I wouldn't say a utopian perspective, but also uh, we often need to have a more idealistic approach because we have to really envision what kind of society we want to be a part of. You know, and I think one of the, the things I'm here advocating is that of a democratic workplace. Of self-organizing governance to bridge across these silos, which will provide interoperability across a variety of teams, and then providing proper incentive alignment. So the future of work uh, will be anything but traditional. Um, if you have a company and you're going to start one today, it very much looks like this structure here. It's a pyramid shape, and that's been around for a very long time. You have a, it looks a bit like this when you fill it in. You got a CEO at the top, and you got top management, and mid-level management, lower management, even non-lower management. You know, and you got data coming from the bottom, and then you have all the decision making come from the top, and then capital extraction uh, is decided by the board of directors, and that has been the mainstay for a very long time. And then what we have are these layers of bureaucracy that are basically presented because of the Dunbar number. You have information that has to get passed to the VP level management and the senior management and the executive management and so forth and so on. So what will the next generation structure look like? If we're taking into account the insight we have from looking at the past, understanding the capabilities of these tools, and as if it were a Adam Smith or Karl Marx of days past looking at economic theory and structure with that benefit of hindsight. And I, I propose it might be something like this, which is a, a circular pattern, a, a vir virtu virtuous cycle in which we have developers, investors, we have users, we incorporate a liquid democracy, and there's, that's a whole other topic unto itself, uh, but really putting into effect a sense of social responsibility uh, that's really needed in today's world uh, for sustainability. Uh, the rules are changing. Uh, the economic rungs are being cut from the bottom. So here you have a robot kind of swimming in, you know, cutting away the ladder. Uh, that's because we're seeing that a lot of the drudgery of the past has been uh, absorbed through artificial intelligence, but more so, that tide is rising because the capabilities are only increasing as time goes on. And it may seem like it's going slow, but um, over time we're going to see an increased acceleration. And uh, we've seen the adoption of from, uh, from vehicles into radio and television all the way up through the internet and social media. Uh, the adoption has increasingly gotten shorter. So there are four kinds of work. This is from HBR. Uh, technological, empo technological empowerment, uh, democratization of work. So this is the current state today. We have you know, full-time employment, contract, part-time work. Over here we have today with turbocharged. We have all these new technologies that are coming out. We have G Suite, Asana, Slack, all these really amazing tools, and they're fantastic, but it's really meant for a, a full-time employee, and that's the, the, the structure of their business model. On the democratization side, we have the emergence of these new platforms. We have gig working and, and Upwork and WeWork and Fiverr and all these other things. But it really hasn't benefited the people that are involved in them, and it still has become a capital extracted model in which people at Uber are still making uh, around minimum wage, that, that drive for Uber. Um, over here is what we're imagining is a different type of system, a future state, which is high democratization, high technological empowerment, which includes shared ecosystems, ad hoc teams coming together, similar to a way a Hollywood movie is made. You have people that come together, they band together for a particular project, they disband, and then join together again when new projects are needed. And there's interoperability among these groups. But the, is the, the biggest issue is managing trust, and solving some of the problems related to that. So the main focus is people, process, and technology, and in that order, and that's very important, because the people are, are ultimately what makes a business. Um, they've seen other projects that have come up, um, like the DAO, which tried to resort everything down to bits. And you saw millions of dollars that were lost and people very dis discouraged by those types of projects. Uh, and we think that people are ultimately behind transactions. People are customers. Work is about people. 
Uh, next is the other processes and how things get accomplished, and we can find additional efficiencies there. And ultimately, technology is about scale. And it comes through three steps. We have assisted intelligence, where humans comprehend data and generate insight. Augmented intelligence, where machine learning augments the human decision. And then eventually, an autonomous intelligence, which executes autonomously as an AI agent. We have siloed information. We have silos in work today. And what this results in is high bench cost. If you want a specialized talent, if you want a, thank you, if you want a, um, a data scientist, they're very expensive, they're hard to find, it's very competitive. So there is a high bench cost associated with it. And if you don't have that work for that person to do, they're going to get very discouraged and they won't uh, be engaged in the work they do. They'll be likely to leave. So you have a high turnover rate. A collaborative model for shared resources includes a talent trust ecosystem. So there is an ability for talent sharing. So like you can, you, it was unimaginable a few years ago, you could share your car, you could share your house. Uh, what if you could share your employees? Or what if there was a different structure where that was possible? Uh, global collaboration, network of networks, uh, connecting different silos, so I mentioned interoperability, and load balancing of human resource utilization. In the same way you would load balance a server, having an intelligent aspect of where you could load balance the uh, utilization of billable time for various workers. And then of course streamlining the payments. So we wrote a white paper on this um, to solve kind of two main pieces. One is the inputs and the other is the output. We have the proposal mechanism, which is standardization of the statement of work. Uh, it's where most margins lost, most expectations mismanaged. And the proof of value protocol, which provides alignment and reduces the transaction cost. So we had to take into account user acceptance testing. We had to take into account approvals and quality assurance. What we wanted to do is allow people to work from anywhere. A bit like an MMO video game. If you ever play Clash of Clans or World of Warcraft, these are thousands of people that come together from all over the world and they work on a quest. But instead of a quest, we'll have deliverables. This is very much possible with work. You could have ranks, you can have perks, you can have elders and generals like you can in Clash of Clans, and you can manage the governance in a, with an interface. Translate to the next generation. So we're gonna have to be a bit more bold and experimental in trying some of these new ideas. But regardless of the economic system, uh, in the end, is for that system to provide the most for the most. So thank you so much for having me here today. And it was very good speaking with you.